So let's wrap up our conversation on research methods, but particularly correlations from our uh, research methods notes part one. So the biggest thing, or I guess the second biggest thing that you have to understand with correlations is that correlation does not mean causation, okay? We cannot say when given a relationship between two items that they then cause each other, okay? We cannot say that. Um, and here is an example as to why. You might see low self-esteem low in, in a participant or in anyone, right? Low self-esteem could cause depression, right? Statement two could then be that depression then causes low self-esteem. You could then say that distressing events or biological predisposition could cause low self-esteem and or depression. You cannot say that one or the other causes the other variable because in a correlation, the route is both ways. Low self-esteem could cause depression, just like depression could cause low self-esteem, but even then, some outside variable that's not even talked about in that relationship could cause both of those items. So knowing that two items are correlated does not necessarily tell us why or exactly how they are related. We just know they are related and we need to be happy with that. So again, correlation does not mean causation. Write that down, circle it, start, highlight it, put a cloud around it, anything. Make sure you remember it in your brain. So the three types of research we wanna wrap up talking about, descriptive or observational, correlation, which we've kind of hit the nail on the head there, and then the experiment. So naturalistic observation is just the observation of human or animal behavior in the environment in which it typically occurs. Jane Goodall being an example here with the chimpanzee culture. This is like, for instance, you want to, on a weekly basis, see which day of the week students are most rowdy in the commons. So you would go down to the commons every fourth and fifth bell and you would simply sit and observe and write what you see. You're not interacting necessarily. I mean, I guess you could talk to people and ask questions, but you're just observing. Uh, it's valuable where other methods are likely to be disruptive or even misleading. So, but the problems with a naturalistic observation, if people know they are being observed, they tend to act differently. This is called the Hawthorne effect. You should write that down. Um, ethically, you usually must tell people you are observing them, um, but can combat by observing for a long period of time. You can combat the Hawthorne effect that way um, because they then kind of just get used to you and start acting as if you aren't there. Observations can also be distorted if observers expect to see certain behaviors. So if you're going to the commons expecting that on Fridays students are off the chain in the commons, um, it's going to impact what you see. You are more likely to see kids being rowdy on those days simply because you expect it. And that could be a problem. A case study is another method, it's intensive. It's one-to-one, -one, right? It's an intensive examination of behavior and mental processes associated with a specific person or even a specific situation. In a case study, you're talking one person or a small group of people and the given situation that they want treated or observed, et cetera. They're useful when something is new, complex, or fairly rare. It's used in clinical work and in neuropsychology. Um, like a new technique in brain surgery, right? It's, it's a whole new process and they just wanna try it on one person, not a big group of people. The limitations being that it can contain evidence that a certain research thought to be important, but then it ends up not really being that important. So you can't make generalizations to everyone. You're unlikely to be representative of people in general. So again, write this down. You can't make generalizations to the entire population when you only do a case study. However, it does provide valuable material for further research. It serves as a testing ground for new treatment, training programs, or other applications of research. The idea being here, look at this small little thing we did. We can't really apply that to everyone, so it, you should move forward and do an experiment so that then, given a representative sample, we can say that this applies to the population. Survey, you guys have probably taken a bajillion of these, a technique for ascertaining self-reported attitudes, opinions, or behaviors of people using a questioning 
um, by questioning a representative random sample of people. I want you to underline or circle that it's self-reported attitudes, opinions, behaviors. Whenever you want to know the political beliefs of people or how they feel self-esteem-wise on each day of the week, it's all self-reported. Their levels of happiness, anything about feelings, attitudes, opinions, you always give a survey. The validity of data depends on how the questions are worded. You can't have framing or leading questions that makes it difficult for participants to answer one way or the other. And then representativeness of people being surveyed, you've got to make sure that you get a representative sample of the entire population so you can make generalizations to the population. Some limitations. Willingness of people to honestly complete the survey, honesty being one limitation, but getting people to do it being another. And people may say what they believe they should say about an issue, right? They, they are going to report what they think they should say or do, not what they actually say or do in some cases. It's still a great way to gather large amounts of information. We're going to talk more about actual experience and a whole nother topic and set of notes in the near future. But let's talk about quasi experiments. These are like almost or even fake quasi fake experiments. These are studies that have the same control as experiments, yet do not include the random assignment of participants. And I want you to add what I'm about to say to your notes because it would be unethical to do it otherwise. Quasi experiments are used because it would be unethical to randomly assign the variables to a control or experimental group. It would be unethical to do that. So let me give you an example. The researchers want to test the hypothesis that a pregnant woman's use of drugs will cause abnormalities in her developing baby, in her developing fetus, right? So they do quasi experiments. Here's why. In an actual experiment, you would have to get all pregnant participants split them into two groups, experimental and control. Control group, here's a placebo of crack cocaine. Now your experimental group, here is actual crack cocaine. Please go do this while you are pregnant. No, no, if that doesn't raise a red flag for you, I don't know what will. You cannot assign any participant, let alone pregnant ones, to consume a narcotic like that, right? Um, you cannot ethically randomly assign women who are eight weeks pregnant to do a drug, right, three times a day. Obviously, no, you can't do that. However, unfortunately, does this not exist in our society already? Yes, very sadly so. So you find those people who are consuming those drugs while pregnant, for instance, and you experiment. You do a quasi-experiment um, measuring and assessing what's going on. Conclusions are not as firm in quasi-experiments as those drawn from true experiments, but they do allow research to be conducted on topics and in settings that would otherwise be impossible because it's unethical. And then here in a couple set of notes, we're going to talk about actual true experiments. 